Good morning. Thank you for coming to my presentation. I'm Anna Calavan, and I'm going to present a paper that is called The 20 ways to wait, 23 Ways to Nudge that presents a systematic review of technology mediating nudging. So let me start by introducing the context of our work. So as many of you might know, personal informatic systems, which are tools that help people to collect and reflect on personal data, such as the amount of steps that people walk, these tools are becoming increasingly prevalent. However, despite the potential of these tools, recent research has emphasized that people fail to get ins uh, insights from behavioral data, and they often discard the tools after a couple of months of use. And one of the reasons for this failure is that most of personal informatic tools and behavior change technologies are informatic centric. So these tools rest on the assumption that people ha lack the knowledge to successfully implement change on their behavior, and it's the goal of the tool to help people collect this data, help them to review the data and reflect on their behaviors, and this will lead to the behavior change. And this emphasis on reflection as a mean for behavior change has been noted by a recent paper who found that 94% of behavior change technology has been designed to tap into the reflective mind, and only 6% tap into the automatic. However, research has been shown that people do not make uh, much decisions using the reflective mind. So it is estimated that 95% of our decisions are made intuitively by using heuristics and cognitive biases. So actually, behavior change technologies should explore the automatic mind to change behaviors. But how we can design for the automatic mind? And why way is true nudging? So the term of nudging was introduced 10 years ago, and it described any aspect of the choice architecture that can alter people's behavior in a predictable way without forbidding any option or changing their incentives. So leveraging the concept of nudging, researchers have designed small changes in the way that choices and information are presented with the goal of guiding to desired choices. So for instance, one of the most popular nudges has been introduced in a supermarket. So usually when you go to the cash register, you have like a basque impulse, and they put there, they locate there very unhealthy items such as cake and snacks. And what they did was to replace these unhealthy snacks by fruit and other healthy items. And they found that while the both options were still available, like cake and fruit, just positioning the healthy item nearby at, at, at eye level, it was enough to motivate people to, to adopt healthy, healthy options. So our question was how to nudge. So over the past 10 years, a lot of researchers have been designing and studying nudges on a lot of contexts like marketing and in behavior change technology. However, we still have an understanding on how to nudge. We have a lot of understanding which heuristics and biases people use during the decision, but we don't know how to explore these heuristics and cognitive bias to design behavior change technology. And in order to answer this question, we conducted a systematic review of the use of nudging in ACI. And our goal was to lay out the design space of nudging. So for this purpose, we look at the top ACI venues since the publication of the nudge book, since the the concept nudging and merge, and we analyze every paper that had one of the following uh, keywords, nudge, cognitive bias, and persuasion. All the papers presented at least one novel technology mediating nudge and leverage at least one heuristic or cognitive bias. So all in all, 71 papers were selected and mostly were found in CHI. And we were able to create this framework that Ha, uh, found, we found 23 different mechanisms of nudging. So demonstrate how we can design systems using these mechanisms. And we cluster these mechanisms in six high-level categories that explain the what. So these are the strategies that we can use to nudge. And we link this to the why. So all these 23 nudging mechanisms, they leverage 15 cognitive biases. So this is our framework. These are the six categories that we identify. However, due to time limitations in this presentation, I will only present the two first categories, but I will encourage you to read the paper and reach me if you have any question. So the first category is the facilitate. So nudges in this category, they try to nudge people to adopt healthy behaviors by diminishing individuals' physical or mental effort. And these strategies tap into the status quo bias, which denotes our tendency to, to resist to change. So we usually try to adopt the option that requires less effort because the, uh, the time and effort for looking to another uh, alternative is too costly. 
So there are different ways to facilitate and how to describe the different mechanisms. So for instance, hiding consists on making undesirable options harder to reach. And Lee designed an online shopping website where people need to navigate between the pages to select the items that they want to buy. And what they did was to locate unhealthy items in the last two pages of the website. So this adds extra effort to the user to buy unhealthy items. A different category is the confirm. So now just in this category, they want to pause an unwanted action and prompt some reflection. And this taps on the regret aversion bias, which denotes our tendency to become more careful making decisions when we perceive a certain level of risks. So for instance, Harbach, they redesigned the Google Play Store. So every time that one user wants to install an application, it will present the, the risks that are associated. So for instance, if one application requires access to the storage, the application will search for pictures of the user on the phone and will prompt the message, this app can see and delete your pictures. A different example is presented by one. They designed a Google Chrome plugin that paused the publication of a Facebook post for 10 seconds. And they added the pictures of some friends and they added the message, these people and X hundred friends can see your publication. And they found that while the counter was avoided, people actually re-examined the content of the post and edited the, the post before publishing. So all in all, after doing our analysis, we raised three main questions related with the nudges. So the first question was related to the manipulation. The second was related with effectiveness. And the third one is through the design of these uh, systems. So one of the main criticisms of nudging is that they work by manipulating people's choices. So in order to answer this question, we built on Hassan and Jespersen work, and we positioned all the 23 mechanisms in two different axes. So the first one refers to the reflected, the mode of uh, thinking engage. So some nudges work by tapping into the reflected mind, and some nudges work by tapping on the automatic. The second axis refers to the transparency of the nudge. So transparency nudge are nudge where the individual can understand the means and the intentions behind the nudge. They understand that he's being persuaded and why. So we position all the 23 mechanisms in this axis. And as you may see in this quadrant, so 52%, so the majority of the nudges, they have been designed to prompt reflective choice. So these nudges doesn't raise ethical concerns because they tap into the reflective mind and they're automatic. The second most explored nudges that try to influence behavior. And this may raise some ethical concerns because they tap into the automatic mind. However, because they're transparent, people actually can understand that they can be persuaded. So for instance, ambient feedback, we actually, if we pay attention, we know that we're being persuaded, even we can understand the means, the, the goal of the nudge. Lastly, we found 22% of nudges, they attempt to, to manipulate behavior. And these kind of nudges, indeed, they raise ethical concerns. However, we found that not, it's not always the case that these nudges manipulate behaviors. So for instance, in case of the opt-out policies, we found one study where the authors all adopted an opt-out policy. So they automatically enrolled people in a vaccination program where people needed to, to unenroll in order to, 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 to not be vaccinated. And they found that 61% of the users, they actually opt out from the vaccination program. So it's very unlikely that the users didn't saw the, the nudge. And this is positive because it highlights that while these nudges aim to manipulate behavior, people actually decided otherwise. So it still has some freedom of choice. So a second question was relating with the effectiveness of the nudge. We wanted to understand if different mechanisms were related to to more effective nudges. And we found no direct relation, but we found that the effectiveness of the nudge is related with their implementation in a specific context. So one of the risks of nudging, especially the one that tap into the automatic mind, is the lack of educational effects. So for instance, the first example, they changed the default option to double side print to reduce the amount of papers that people were using when printing. And they found that while the nudge was presented, people actually double side print. However, they found that when they introduced new printers, people didn't change the default option to print double site. In another example, Rogers includes twinkle lights to reveal the, the path between the door to the staircase. So he wanted to motivate people to take the stairs over the elevator. And 
During the study, in the end of the study, they had a wiring problem and the lights stopped working. And they found that it was enough time for the people to reflect on the behaviors and people actually was still taking the, the stairs even when the lights were not presented. Nudging effects may also not sustain over time. So for instance, if a user identifies a placebo, this can create feelings of distrust with the system. And graphic warmings can also lose the resonance over the time. Nudges can have unexpected effects. So for instance, people can print more because they carry less weight because they're double side printing. Some nudges works by creating friction. This can be perceived as intrusive and can create reactance. And we found that the timing and the strength of the nudge is also very important. So for instance, Raisin found that the right moment to present the consequence of smoking is not while people are smoking, but way before, so before they make this decision. And the strength of the nudge is also important. So in the case of the opt-out policy for the vaccination program, they added a link in the email with the vaccination day, and through the link they could opt out. And they found that it was so easy to opt out that this led to a, a, a high opt-out rate. Lastly, lastly, stroke preference and habits can also have an influence on the nudge. So for instance, the more a user smoke, he's less likely to be affected by the nudge. Our last question, aiming to identify which type of nudges should be used in different situations. And in order to answer this question, we built on Fox behavioral model, who suggests that in order for a person to, to follow a target behavior, she should have, he or she should have sufficient motivation, sufficient ability, and effective trigger. So we position it all the 23 mechanisms using Fox triggers. So we have facilitators triggers that try to, to increase people's ability to pursue a behavior, sparks that increase people's motivation to do a behavior, and signal triggers that attempt to remind of the behavior. So you can see that most of the nudges are designed to, to increase motivation. So all in all, our systematic review allows us to contribute with a framework that links the why with the how and the what of nudging. We were able to identify six reasons that can lead to the failure of a technology mediating nudge. And we analyzed the ethical risk of the nudge that were identified in the review. And as a takeaway, we wanted to highlight that we found that 50% of the studies that we review had a duration of one day. So we don't have much understanding of the long-term consequence of these nudges. And more importantly, we, we observed that only seven studies inquiry into the effect of the nudge after the removal. So we highly encourage individuals and researchers to please to take those things into consideration when they design their technology mediating nudges. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anna. Questions, please come to the front. Thanks, great talk. Um, Alex Kale, University of Washington. Um, so I'm wondering uh, how you would, you know, based on your systematic review, how can we apply um, this prior work on nudging, this theoretical perspective uh, that you've laid out to uh, tools that maybe don't have to do so much with trying to get people to adjust their, um, you know, sort of activities that affect their health status, but say in the context of um, you know, the workplace. Uh, for instance, in my work, I've been thinking about researchers um, and, and sort of trying to, how do you enforce sort of best practices uh, in research? And I'm sort of wondering if nudging uh, could be sort of a, a potential way to do that. So I'm wondering if you can comment on the applicability of uh, this theoretical perspective to designing interfaces, say, for the workplace. So I will say that everything that we do is about nudging. So even like the location of the bathrooms in, the, in, this, uh, in this place is nudging us. So I will say that nudging can be applied in, 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 your, in your context, in your research. But I'm not sure if I understood well your question. <laughs> because there's an echo here, it's hard to understand. My name is 
Louise Wei Yu from National University of Singapore. I really, really like this uh, presentation and work. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is actually the, uh, the distinction between automatic and reflected press processing, right? So do you see Najas um, being able to actually take advantage of the more reflective state of human mind? You know, nudge people to deliberate, for, in for instance, from uh, all these uh, studies you have reviewed. Can you give me maybe a few examples and how you think about it? So, for instance, there was a lot of, uh, we wanted to show also through the, the graph and the axis, there's no latent conflict between uh, nudges and the reflective mind, nor either uh, uh, transparent nudges and the automatic mind. So, you were asking if... Have you seen nudges that actually prompt people to be more thoughtful, mind, mindful? Right? Uh, no, I have seen one that explores subliminal messages and ambient feedback to make people more relaxed. But in that context, we haven't, uh, we haven't found one that I remember now. Okay, uh, thanks for the talk. I'm Yun Long from University of Constance, Germany. Um, I noticed that there were some uh, taxonomies for health behavior uh, change intervention. Uh, for example, the BCT taxonomy. Hmm? I think uh, you might know that. And also the uh, like uh, persuasive system design. So I see your work. Uh, I might take it as uh, another taxonomy. Uh, so have you compared your uh, taxonomy but you have several, uh, several uh, categories uh, to, for the intervention. Uh, have you compared your like, concepts or design space with the existing taxonomies? So is there uh, like overlap or do you find some more like, new uh, techniques or concepts uh, which didn't exist in the existing uh, taxonomies? Thank you. So we... We built on Hansen and Jesperson's work, so he already had his axis based on the reflective and automatic mind and the transparent and non-transparent. But they're focused on the marketing and uh, uh, public policy. So we believe that we extended this to the more like technological context. And we have indeed compared some of the categories that we have, so for instance with uh, Michi's model, and there are some categories that might overlap. but. Uh, we cluster these categories based on the, the why they work, so the, the cognitive biases. So it's hard to make these decisions between nudges in specific categories. And also, like, some nudges can be designed in different ways, so it's really hard to, to, to position it in one uh, specific category. So I will say that, that yeah, it can overlap other, other taxonomies. Okay. I also just wondered if you're able to say something about, uh, so the papers that you reviewed, what kind of theories did they use themselves? So did they just use the term nudge then did something or did they rely on other psychological theories to build these nudges in the first place? No, actually, uh, I think only four of the papers refer to the term nudging. So we found that they, all of them use uh, persuasive strategies, but they actually do not build on this, on this uh, concept of nudging. They don't actually refer to why this works. So the, the concept is so vast and the literature is so vast that it's hard to, you know, to narrow down to, to a specific nudging technique. But no, we haven't because it, like only three or four were really related and mentioning the nudging strategies. Okay, let's uh, thank our speaker once again. <laughs>